today's uh, DCR Research Conference speaker, Dr. Brian McCrindle. Um, Dr. McCrindle is a professor of pediatrics at the University of Toronto, and he's a staff cardiologist and senior scientist of the Labatt Family Heart Center at the Hospital for Sick Children. Uh, he's the uh, section head of preventive cardiology and head of the institution's childhood obesity research team, which was funded by the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. Um, Dr. McCrindle was a member of the NHLBI commissioned uh, Pediatric Cardiovascular Risk Reduction Program uh, Expert Panel, and he recently received the uh, Harold Siegel Award of Merit from the Canadian Cardiovascular Society uh, in recognition of his important contributions to the prevention of heart disease in Canada through a combination of clinical care, research, education, and advocacy. Dr. McCrindle has been the principal investigator with the NHLBI-sponsored uh, Pediatric Heart Network uh, since its inception, and uh, he provides leadership to the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society uh, Data Coordinating Center. Uh, Dr. McConnell directs the um, Cardiovascular Clinical Research Unit at SickKids, uh, which provides study coordination and data management to approximately 150 current uh, active studies. Um, after graduating from the University of Alberta in uh, Edmonton, Canada, Dr. McCrindle completed pediatric residency, a Robert Wood Johnson Fellowship, an MPH degree, and a fellowship in pediatric cardiology at the Johns Hopkins Medical Institutions in Baltimore. Uh, he then spent two years as a uh, practicing cardiologist uh, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, before joining the faculty at the University of uh, Toronto in 1992. Uh, Dr. McCrindle's uh, extensive clinical and research interests include uh, preventive cardiology, uh, thrombosis, Kawasaki disease, exercise and functional outcomes, rehabilitation, transition to adult care, and overall outcomes research and clinical trials. Uh, Dr. McCrindle has over 490 total publications, which has, have essentially covered every aspect of uh, pediatric cardiology. Please join me in uh, greeting Dr. McCrindle. So uh, I'm not going to talk about everything in my CV today. I'm only going to talk about uh, my affiliation with the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society and some of the things that I've learned, primarily uh, from being tutored by uh, Eugene Blackstone. So I have to first disclose that I am, I'm, I'm a user, or an, particularly an early adopter of these uh, analysis techniques. I'm not a developer, and I'm, I'm not also not this kind of, <laughs> of user as well. And it's your own fellows that made me have to put something in about Rob Ford. So I'll first tell you about the CHSS as a society. It started off um, many years ago, and initially it was a very uh, informal group gathering of some of the, the leading congenital heart surgeons. There was some exclusivity. Uh, they only included uh, surgeons who were established and had uh, some academic output, it included people from North and South America. The original membership was sort of capped at 50 members. They would have occasional meetings where the, the goal was to discuss work in progress and clinical challenges. There was no constitution or bylaws. Uh, there may have been a secret handshake. Uh, I'm the only uh, member of the CHSS who's not a surgeon. I'm not sure how that happened. To this day, uh, people still ask me my surgical technique for various things and I'm not really sure how to respond. But as the society evolved, it eventually became the, the society for uh, congenital heart surgeons. And one of the things that it initiated was something called the data center. It also started to capture institutional and member dues, primarily to support the activities of the data center. At the meetings, the presentations became more formal. There were video sessions, controversy sessions. Eventually, the whole thing uh, required a higher level of organization with constitution, bylaws, committees, governance structures. They began to extend, expand the membership, so now there's more than 100 members. And they have also started having the occasional uh, joint meeting with an equivalent society in Europe. And uh, also, uh, the data center has acquired a dedicated uh, fellow who comes, and, uh, comes from one of the member institutions and spends uh, two years uh, learning these techniques, which I'm going to present a lot of their work, actually, today. So this is a map of all the current uh, CHSS centers. And yes, uh, I, uh, Duke is a center. 
The CHSS Data Center uh, was initiated under the leadership of John Kirkland and Eugene Blackstone. And it was around a time uh, when the uh, it, sort of the standard of care for treating transposition of the great arteries was to do an atrial baffle procedure. And, but there was this new operation called the arterial switch where you lop off the great vessels and you switch them around and sew them back on. However, it had to be done in the neonatal period, which meant that it was associated with a higher mortality than doing a later uh, atrial switch procedure. Now, there was no stomach amongst any of the surgeons to actually do a randomized clinical trial, but they knew that if they didn't start collecting the data, that they would never know the answer as to which procedure was going to be better. There was a feeling that the, the arterial switch you paid a price in terms of early mortality, but then you gain benefit in terms of, of long-term mortality and functional outcomes. So we've since then initiated a number of uh, sort of lesion-specific cohorts that spanned most of the more complex types of congenital heart disease. And each of these uh, cohorts have enrolled quite large numbers of patients from usually around uh, 20 to 35 institutions enrolling in each study. Now the structure of these studies is that participation in the study is voluntary and at the expense of the institution. It's a research database, it's not a registry, so we're collecting uh, a lot of detailed information on subgroups of patients. It's observational data collection, it's not protocol driven, and the focus uh, of the analyses tends to be on events and transition between various states. And most, for the most part, uh, patients are enrolled at the time that they present to a CHSS member institution. The way the data collection works is that people don't fill out forms, they actually submit de-identified copies of the of discharge summaries, echo reports, um, surgical notes. Uh, we occasionally supplement that data collection with, we'll get echo, uh, echocardiograms from the first visit and we may actually adjudicate them, have an, sort of an echo core lab that will make uh, standardized measurements. The cohorts, the aim of the cohorts is to follow patients in the long term to get, because uh, most of the outcomes evolve over a longer period of time. So we have a structure in place that all the cohorts have a, an annual follow-up. But what separates the uh, CHSS from a lot of other types of these database collections is the degree of sophistication with which the data analysis is performed, which allows us to, to answer some very complex questions. So the main interests of the CHSS is they are interested in, in time-related events, particularly most surgeons are very interested in uh, death or, and reoperation. They're also interested in predicting, being able to predict which patients would do better with which types of management strategies, and to identify factors that could be uh, altered that might improve outcomes. And to, and to look at uh, what are the optimal management pathways. They also have some uh, interest in identifying high risk and low risk institutions. And more recently, they've, they've moved beyond things to look at uh, other than just uh, mortality, medical morbidity, and procedures to start looking at functional outcomes as well. So the theme of this talk is I'm gonna be talking about how the CHSS has evolved in the man modeling of time-related events. So the kind of the standard way that people do it is they do it in the non-parametric realm, and I'm sure you all are familiar with Kaplan-Meier curves, which allow you to uh, incorporate information on subjects that are censored. So patients that reach the end of the follow-up without having achieved the event of interest, lost a follow-up, uh, and those patients actually contribute information uh, regarding uh, freedom from the event, but the estimates are calculated with the censored patients falling out of both the numerator and the denominator. Uh, 
which sometimes I'm going to show you how that, how that becomes a problem. Underlying a, a Kaplan-Meier curve is sort of the rate. You can calculate the instantaneous rate at which events are occurring. We call that the hazard. And if we wanted to look at risk factors uh, associated with these uh, non-parametric estimates of survival, we can do what's called a Cox's proportionate hazard model. But what we've done uh, in the data center is we've uh, modeled survival in the parametric uh, realm. And in 1986, Jean Blackstone, together with uh, David Naftel and uh, Marshall Turner, came up with a way that they could parametrically model the survival, but also uh, could break it up into uh, phases and look for risk factors within specific phases. So if you look at a, a typical Kaplan-Meier curve, usually what you see is a high early rate of events, then there's a, a, a tapering off, but it's usually not a flat line. And then as the follow-up progresses, uh, events start to pick up. And this is actually would be sort of what the mortality would look like of an average person in the general population as they live their lifespan. So you could imagine, however, that the factors that would influence the freedom from event might be different across these different periods. So one of the things that we can do is we can use we can mathematically model the underlying hazard. So this is a graph of that Kaplan-Meier curve, but instead of giving you like the cumulative probability of survival, this is giving you the instantaneous rate. So you can see there's a very high early peak. It tapers down, but doesn't reach the baseline. So there's an ongoing constant risk, and then it starts to accelerate. And what uh, we've been able to do is to take this survivorship curve and the underlying hazard and cumulative hazard and to break it up into three separate parts. So an early, this curve here is broken into an early part, a constant part, and then a late part. And we can mathematically model the uh, shape of that, those parts. And that's where the parameters come in. And we can model different kinds uh, patterns of an early uh, phase risk. A constant risk is just a straight line, easy to model. And, uh, and these are some of the different patterns of late risk. And these, uh, these uh, algorithms can actually handle uh, right, left, and interval sensor data. It has a, uh, the, an automated uh, variable selection algorithm, so it can be bootstrapped to help you to guide variable selection in multivariable models. Specific risk factors can be identified for these different phases, uh, which are active throughout the entire period of observation. But what's important for us is this can create a multivariable model which, uh, like any other regression equation, can be solved to yield uh, a prediction for a specific set of patient or clinical characteristics. We can do prediction plots. We can do nomograms. So I'm going to first start with one of the, the first studies that, and the simplest study. You might not think it's simple by the time I get to the end of it that had to do with a, our cohort of critical aortic stenosis. So critical aortic stenosis uh, presents in uh, the newborn period, usually due to um, a severe left ventricular dysfunction or to uh, the consequences of reduced systemic outflow. So they present in, in shock. And however, the spectrum of disease can vary from just having uh, an isolated stenosis of the pulmonary valve where all the other structures are normal, all the way up to, to the point where you get what's called hypoplastic left heart syndrome with sev you know, severe hypoplasia of the left ventricle, uh, the ascending aorta, the mitral valve, and uh, the left atrium. So if you happen to have a simple defect, all we really need to do is open up your valve. And then you have a, a, a good biventricular uh, heart. But if you're on the extreme end, uh, 
that left side is really not useful. And so what we do is a series of operations whereby we connect the systemic veins, the superior vein and inferior vena cava, directly into the pulmonary arteries and therefore um, bypass the heart and reserve the pumping chamber that you do have to become the systemic pumping chamber by making uh, connections between the pulmonary artery trunk and the remainder of the aorta. Now there's a, however, a large proportion of patients that kind of fall in between. And so we're not really sure for those patients that fall in the gray zone, how do we choose which way they should go? Uh, because uh, there's a belief that a, if you have a biventricular repair, that that's gonna give you a better long-term result uh, in terms of of exercise capacity and ability to function in the long term. But if you make a mistake and you push a borderline candidate down the biventricular repair pathway, they may fail and they may die. So our cohort enrolled uh, 320 neonates from 94 to 2000. 19 uh, died without receiving an intervention and six went to primary transplantation. But 116 had an initial uh, valvotomy procedure, an opening of the valve that suggested they were headed down the biventricular repair pathway. And 179 had a Norwood connection, reconstruction of the aortic arch, together with putting a connection, a shunt connection to the pulmonary arteries, implying that they were on the single ventricle repair pathway. And this was the one study where we did because we wanted quantitative information on structures. We got the initial echocardiograms and we did uh, an adju adjudicated review. So in the 116 patients that had went down the biventricular route, we plotted their par survival parametrically and then identified factors that were associated with uh, survival uh, or mortality and higher grade of endocardial fibroelastosis. These patients with hypoplastic ventricles can develop very thickened uh, linings of the inside of the ventricles that make the ventricles very stiff, a smaller size of the aortic valve, and younger age at entry into the study. So uh, the younger age at entry in the study um, was actually, uh, it, it implies that the younger the age at which you present, the more severe your left-sided hypoplasia is leading to shock and presentation. So it was just a proxy for, it could be a proxy for um, the physiology and the anatomy. So the other thing we did is we also created a, a survival curve for the patients that went down the single ventricle pathway and we also looked for, modeled it parametrically and looked for factors associated with it and was a, the smaller the absolute size of the ascending aorta and the presence of significant tricuspid valve regurgitation were risk factors more, for mortality. Because when you think about the tricuspid valve in the single ventricle pathway, it's, a, it's the uh, systemic atrioventricular valve. So what we then did, so we now got have two regression equations. So what we did is we combined those two groups of patients together, and then for every single patient, we took their characteristics and plotted them through each of these two equations. So we would know, based on their characteristics, what their predicted survival would be if it was a biventricular repair, and what their predicted survival would be if they'd gone down the single ventricle pathway. And so we could come up with a single number, which was the difference in survival between those two pathways. And then we just did a multiple linear regression. So, and, and pretty much all of the factors that came into the individual models also were significant in and this linear regression model, but an additional variable came in and it, it was the uh, left ventricular length. So this is now a standard multivariable linear regression equation. If I solved it for uh, different, uh, for each of these variables, put in a, fa a, a, a patient's characteristics for each of these variables, it would give me the difference in survival 
if they'd gone down a single ventricle versus the biventricular repair pathway. So if it's a positive number, it means they would have had better survival going down the single ventricle pathway. If it's a negative number, they would have been predicted to have better survival going down the biventricular repair pathway. And, and we can then use that for prediction. So this was a, an example of how we can solve that equation. So this is a patient that, from the study that had, uh, went down the single ventricle pathway and happened to survive. This is their characteristics, and they were in a bit of the gray zone. And when you solve the equation, they come up with a positive number of, of plus 10%, which would be, which would be put, put them in favor of going down the biventricular repair pathway. So this, this is, this is a, an example of how we can use this equation. This is a patient who went down the biventricular pathway and died and their characteristics, and when we put those characteristics into the regression model, they actually would have had better survival, a lot better survival, if they had gone down the single ventricle pathway. So we now have a calculator that uh, clinicians can use uh, to help them, as another piece of additional information to help them make decisions about those patients in the gray zone. What we did find out was that for the patients that were in this study, of those that had a biventricular repair pathway, 52% uh, of them actually would have been predicted to have done better on the single ventricle pathway. And of those that had the single ventricle pathway, 17% would have been predicted to have done better on the biventricular repair pathway. So there's a bit of a difference there, which indicates the, the favor of clinicians to force those borderline candidates down the biventricular repair pathway at a cost of increased mortality. So there was a problem, however, that evolved over time with the calculator, and, and it was the fact that a lot of these patients were getting diagnosed in utero. So therefore, they presented their age at entry was zero, day one of life, which then didn't have the same meaning as it, the original calculator where age of entry was a proxy for how sick you were and how quickly you presented. So we had to get, we, we had to rejig the model and get rid of that variable. So we did the exact same sequence of steps and uh, this was the final uh, regression equation that we came up with, which included a lot of the same uh, variables that was in the original uh, regression equation, uh, but it seemed that it included uh, more specific information about the mitral valve. So when we solved uh, the, the new calculator for the patients who had biventricular repair in the solid line and the single ventricle repair in the dashed line, this is a score of zero this line here, this is the uh, calculator score, score of zero where either operation could go either way. You can see that there's a lot of biventricular repair patients here that have been pushed down a pathway where they would have better survival in the um, single ventricle pathway. So that things are really shift. What price do you pay? Well, here's the predicted survival of those um, univentricular patients who would have been predicted to have a better survival on the biventricular repair pathway, and here's their actual survival. So, so you do pay a price in terms of increased mortality, and you pay a bigger price if you make the mistake of, of pushing someone down a biventricular repair pathway when they should have gone, had better survival on the single ventricle pathway. And, and you can see that uh, the degree of uh, the, that the, the, it's really sensitive, more sensitive in the um, biventricular repair patients than in the single ventricle repair patients. So, so that's an example of how we can use this parametric modeling and, and its prediction capabilities to help us to, to give us a, a a more rational and data-driven approach to making decision, clinical decisions about management pathways uh, in, in patients where there's a lot of ambiguity.
Now the second uh, problem is that patients may be simultaneously at very varying risk for different kind of mutually exclusive outcomes or events, each of which may have their own set of associated factors. So when you think of a surgical patient, they are simultaneously, once you do the operation, they are simultaneously at risk for death and for reoperation. The kind of workaround people do is they either only look at one of these events at a time or they uh, lump them together as a composite outcome. And what we would suggest is that you can keep them separate and do what's called the competing risk analysis. And kind of the first uh, time that this competing risk analysis was done was using data from the pedi pediatric heart transplant study group where they looked at uh, all listings for heart transplantation in patients less than 18 years of age for a one year period. Now after you've been listed for a heart transplant, you, there are a number of things that could potentially happen to you. You could, you could die without ever having re received a transplant. You could get better and actually not need a transplant and get taken off the list. Um, you could get worse such that uh, you develop sepsis or something and no longer became a or other more or organ failure and got taken off the list because you're not eligible. You could get a transplant or you could still be waiting. So the problem with censoring uh, with the, the non-parametric method is that if you sense, create separate curves for each of these mutually exclusive events, you end up censoring for all the other events. And as I said, there's problems when people are dropping out of both the numerator and the denominator. And so when you calculate, and this is a, a plot of the different Kaplan-Meier curves for these different events, well, if you add up the number of patients in each of these things using the Kaplan-Meier me uh, method, you, you account for 156% of the patients, which that's, that's not correct. So if we parametrically model this, then we can uh, look at the underlying hazard function and actually use the, the rates that we get to keep the, the number of patients uh, stable across the period of observation. But you can see that for each of these different types of events, they all have different patterns of, of hazard over time. And this is what a competing risks plot would look like. So if, if you think of this as the line of the patients who are still on the list and waiting, and these are the patients that are falling into those various types of outcome events. So you, if you were to think of this line coming down as a bucket of water with three holes in it and three other buckets, the, this is the line of the water coming down in the big bucket and the other lines are the other three buckets that are filling up. So that no matter where you cut the line along this period of observation, it's always going to add up to 100%. So, uh, and this is just an example of, of, if you, of the proportion of patients who would die as estimated uh, with Kaplan-Meier censoring versus how much actually did die using the parametric uh, modeling. And, and this is the uh, proportion who were actually transplanted, uh, actually transplanted versus would you would get out of a Kaplan-Meier method. We, Remember that we can also, for these parametric models, put in risk factors as well. And so uh, for each of these different states can have different risk factors and they can also have different phases with different risk factors. And, and because we can solve the equation, we can actually come up with a prediction plot that's a competing risk plot for a specific patient. So this is a, a patient who's status one on a ventilator uh, with adverse uh, adverse uh, uh, variables that would make it hard to transplant. So you can see that, that for this patient, uh, death is a very, the, most of the outcomes are happening very early and death is a very prominent player. As opposed to this uh, patient who's um, a much more favorable patient, uh, less critically ill, uh, you can see the risk of death uh, is much greater than most of the outcomes are happening 
a lot uh, later because they can survive on the list for longer. So it's very useful for a patient because you can, a patient would say, well, what are my chances of getting transplanted by six months of age? Well, you can plug these factors into the competing risk algor algorithm and give them an exact percentage based on this total experience. So, um, so the next application of competing risks I'm going to talk to you about is pulmonary atresia with intact septum. So I told you how critical aortic stenosis was a disease with a wide range of spectrum. Well, this lesion is a, has a wide range of spectrum as well, but it's all on the right side of the heart. So uh, these patients uh, can go down, they, we can just open up the pulmonary valve, and they may be good biventricular repair candidates, or that right ventricle is worth nothing, in which case we go down the single ventricle pathway. But we can also have something in between where, where, if it's, where we can hook up the uh, superior vena cava directly into the pulmonary artery, and it, we call that a one and a half ventricle repair. So uh, this was one of the first studies I did with our very first uh, Kirkland Ashburn fellow, David Ashburn, who we had a cohort of 408 uh, neonates uh, gathered over 10 years. The overall survival in this cohort was 60% at five years. So we still have lots of problems with mortality and congenital heart disease and multiple pathways that are influenced by the degree of right heart abnormalities or hypoplasia. So this is the competing risks curve, again, with those alive without repair, transition to death without repair, a two-ventricle pathway, a Fontan pathway. Down here is a one and a half, and the proportion of patients that went on to primary transplant. So we can uh, look at what do the hazard functions for each of these uh, curves look like, and you can see they're all completely different for each pathway with regards to mortality. So they all have different phases of risk, they all have different patterns of risk, and uh, they actually, uh, so we can model each, each of these uh, end states actually had two phases of risk, an early and a late phase. We identified risk factors for each phase and for each end state, the size of the tricuspid valve uh, is a pretty good proxy for uh, right heart abnormalities. So we were able to, and it, and it did come up in every single model for each of the end states. In the analysis, we also noted that there were a lot of individual institutions that were popping into these models as risk factors for some of these specific events. So we, we decided to look at uh, institutional strategy uh, in this domain. How does the institution's approach to selecting pathways influence the outcomes in that particular institution? And so we could solve that competing risks for specific institutions and relate it to the degree of hypoplasia uh, of the tricuspid valve. So this is an institution that tended to favor pushing people down the biventricular repair pathway. And so you can see that even for some patients with small valves, they're still getting uh, biventricular repairs. There's few Fontans, but the death rate at the lower end is, is quite high. Here's an institution that, that just really favored Fontan for everybody which wound up with them having, across the spectrum, very few two ventricle repairs, but a relatively uh, low level of mortality across the spectrum. This institution was just plain a high risk institution that uh, seems like a lot of the patients died no matter what they did. So a lot of them actually didn't make it to an end state because the mortality was so high. And this is, uh, an institution that took a balanced approach. So, uh, you know, when the tricuspid valve Z score was minus two uh, and below, they preferred the Fontan procedure, the single ventricle pathway, and when it was above, they preferred the biventricular repair pathway, and as a result, their mortality was reasonable across the entire spectrum. 
So that's a, an example of how we use uh, competing risks to actually uh, do predictions that it can give a lot of feedback to institutions and, and give you justification for changing your management strategy. However, you remember that I told you that part of the reason why we keep pushing patients down the biventricular repair pathway is because we think that two ventricles are better than one and it'll give them better long-term functional outcomes. So we actually did a study with the pulmonary atresia cohort, which had been followed out for uh, up to uh, 22 years. And uh, we were able to identify the current survivors because we have an annual follow-up. And we got 39% of the current survivors to participate in a cross-sectional study whereby they filled out some functional health st status questionnaires and had a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And we had reasonable number of patients in each of the three groups, the biventricular, the one and a half, and the single ventricle repair patients. And what we noted with these scores from um, the different, the child health questionnaire, the global health, this is the uh, single ventricle, one and a half, biventricular repair patients, that there might have been some differences with the one and a half doing poorer, but it's a smaller group of patients with no difference uh, between uh, using another questionnaire called the PEDS-QL in terms of their physical health summary score. And this is their exercise capacity uh, with uh, percent predicted for uh, age, their peak oxygen consumption, and their maximum heart rate. And so for their their aerobic capacity, there was really no difference between these three repair groups. So there was really seemed to be no advantage to uh, the, the hypothesis that the biventricular repair patients were doing better was not necessarily true. We looked at how it related to uh, the degree of initial right heart hypoplasia in the three groups. And, and you can see that for all three groups, uh, the, lo the more uh, right-sided hypoplasia they had, the, um, the worse their uh, extra aerobic capacity. But uh, for it the, the line seemed to be uh, steeper for the biventricular repair pathway patients, which says that it's really, if you push the, the borderline patients down that route, you're, you are paying a price in terms of uh, diminished exercise capacity in the long term. Now, moving on, we know that some patients actually require proceeded, repeated procedures of the same type, and that the outcomes of these subsequent procedures may be influenced by preceding procedures. And so I'm going to talk about another lesion called a cohort we have called interrupted aortic arch, where there's an actual discontinuity in the aortic arch. And, and so it's always, nearly always associated with a ventricular septal defect, and part of the upper part of the septum actually is deviated into the left ventricular outflow tract, so they have problems with, uh, with left ventricular outflow obstruction, subaortic stenosis, aortic valve stenosis, but also where they have to repair to reanastomose the two ends of the arch together can be an area of, of scar tissue and a, a source of recurrent obstruction. So we have those two things going on at, at the same time. So this was another uh, fellow, of, uh, CHSS fellow, who looked at our 447 patients with interrupted aortic arch in our cohort. We noted that there were 158 subsequent arch procedures and 100 subsequent left ventricular outflow procedures. Again, overall survival, 60% at 21 years. So again, showing congenital heart disease is not a great disease. So what we did is we did sort of serial competing risks. So we did a, a competing risk from the time of the initial repair, looking at left ventricular outflow tracts subsequent procedures, uh, competing with death. So there, down here, is the the uh, competing risk curves of patients transitioning to having a, their first left ventricular outflow tract procedure. And then what we did is we took the patients 
after they've had a first procedure and re-ran another competing risk as to what happened to them after that. And so this uh, here is the competing risk curve that would indicate them transitioning to having a second uh, left ventricular output procedure. Keeping in mind that a lot of these patients at the same time were also having arch procedures and, and uh, possibly procedures directed at other unrelated abnormalities. Um, and what this curve takes the two competing risk curves and, and puts them in the same graph, and you can see that the risk of a subsequent procedure after the first procedure uh, is lower than after the second procedure. So your risk of having further procedures seems to be increasing with each, with each procedure. That's not true, uh, we found, with the aortic arch, where the risk of, of further arch procedures diminishes with each, each repeated procedure. So that, that's another example of how we can tease out that very complicated outcome. Now, some patients can have uh, related and unrelated procedures that may modulate the risk of a subsequent event. So for example, if we were to put in a, a conduit uh, between the right ventricle of the pulmonary artery, they, they don't grow as the patient grows. They also develop uh, you know, sclerosis and narrowing, and those conduits have to be replaced. However, we have catheter procedures that we can balloon dilate those conduits open, we can put stents in, and they uh, presumably help to increase the uh, time b between the needing another subsequent uh, surgery. And for example, truncus arteriosus is, is one lesion where you need to use these conduits because you only have one, uh, uh, one semilunar valve, so you, you close the VSD to uh, incorporate the truncal valve you lop off the pulmonary arteries from the, the common trunk, and then you put a conduit in from the right ventricle out to the pulmonary arteries, and it establishes that biventricular circulation. So our, our, one of our most recent uh, fellows looked at that cohort of 429 patients, looking at time to replacement, but also was able to incorporate these intervening procedures as what we call time-varying covariates. So we were able to incorporate these things into, uh, into the model. The surgeons were interested in, in whether those procedures had an impact on longevity, but they were also interested in optimizing both the size and the type of conduit to try and see if they could come up with surgeon uh, modifiable factors that would influence outcomes. So th this is an example of some of the plots that we can do, which is a scallop plot, where uh, this would be the um, time to the next conduit replacement if, if you did, uh, and what it, it looks like is that if you put a catheter procedure and put a stent in the uh, conduit, you actually may be reducing the longevity of the conduit. Which, which isn't necessarily true. The, the way to interpret this is that if someone's putting a stent in your conduit, it's probably a conduit that's in trouble and does already have an increased risk of, of uh, requiring replacement. But we were able to do uh, nomograms where we showed that the initial size of the conduit, um, that putting in stent, uh, stents actually does uh, increase the longevity or actually de decreases, but it, and, it, and it is related to the type of conduit that gets put in. So uh, to finish off, uh, where do we go next? Uh, so one of the things that we're trying to work on is actually exploring some of the meaning, how to interpret these time-varying covariates. We, right now, we kind of use them as adjustment factors. Uh, I think we need to figure out a way to actually get information out of them and interpret the meaning of them. We need, we're working on strategies so that we, instead of doing these nested, repeated competing risks, that we can actually model things continuously and people can transition into and out of end states. Right now they can only uh, 
We can only model them transitioning into uh, end states. We're also working on incorporating longitudinal data as factors that may be associated with some of these time-related outcomes. You know, we, we repeatedly do echocardiograms. Can we use some of the changes in, in the measurements that we make on the echo? Can they be used as predictors for some of these time-related events? But uh, what, what more recently, we've been shifting to actually looking at the longitudinal data itself. So, uh, and trying to, to, normally when you do a longitudinal data analysis, um, you're really looking at factors that are active over the entire period of the observation. And what we're working on is, is what we did with the survival functions and trying to break things up into phases, which would allow us to look for risk factors that are operating at different periods in time. And this is a, an early example of some of the way that we've been modeling. Uh, and, uh, and this is uh, a regurgitation in the pulmonary conduits and uh, patients moving from lower grades to higher grades over time. And we can model these different, uh, different shapes of these transitions. So some of the lessons that uh, I've learned through my history working with the CHSS is that if we're going to answer these complex questions, we need a lot of uh, statistical power, which means we, and not just the analysis techniques, but we need the materials. So we need large numbers of patients, and that uh, speaks to the very uh, nature of collaboration. The only way that we're going to answer some of these questions is if we have large multi-institutional data collections that are very rich in detail to allow us to identify these factors and to allow the data to speak for themselves. Um, sometimes uh, it, it, with, with minimal data sets, uh, um, you're trying to do risk stratifications or risk scoring and they tend to be con based on the consensus of experts and not actually on the data themselves. And so one of the goals of, of the data center is to actually bring data into that. So that we, if we're going to do risk adjustment, we're actually identifying the correct factors and we're actually weighting them correctly at the right time points. So the other thing that CHSS has done primarily through the work of Gene Blackstone, it's advanced the level of data analysis within the, the field. And it also has highlighted the utility of using observational data to give you information about management when clinical trials are just not going to be feasible. So the challenges for our society in the future is that it's been around for a long time and usually level of interest and momentum can lag over time. So trying to figure ways to keep these sites uh, engaged in submitting their data. We've had uh, challenges with, with uh, the increasing need for funding and resources. Uh, Privacy legislation and IRBs has added a whole layer of bureaucracy to these multi-institutional data uh, collections. And what, but one of the, the other things, as the data analysis and the results become more con uh, complex, um, the user gets more mystified and has a harder time uh, interpreting it. And so sometimes you, we've had a bit of a backlash where the membership wants us to dumb things down for them, which when you dumb things down, you don't necessarily get the most accurate, accurate answer. The other thing that the, the uh, data center is interested in now, we're starting to talk about actually doing our own clinical trials. And also we've initiated a couple of studies that are actually protocol driven. Where we're, you know, we're actually saying how we want you to do the echoes, what information we want from the echoes. We now have a echo core lab associated with a lot of these studies. So, so that's sort of my overview on on how my history with the CHSS and the history of how uh, increasingly these kinds of efforts are allowing us to answer increasingly complex uh, questions, clinical questions. Uh, that hopefully will influence the outcomes for our patients. Thank you.
think we, we may have time for a few questions. That was a terrific presentation, and I've been a uh, consumer, of, uh, not as much of a distributor as I would have liked to have been to some of the data here, but certainly the the, uh, the left heart obstruction calculator that CHSS has got up is incredibly useful, and, and I think we know a lot more about how to deal with small tricuspid valve, small right heart sizes. But one of the things I want to ask you a little bit about is in your introductory slides, you described, I think, very well the history of the Congenital Heart Surgeon Society as basically initially in without being uh, sexist here, an old boys club where people got together and talked about stuff periodically. And, and that's sort of the history of many professional societies, and now we transition to a much more modern and scientific approach. But one of the things that, that I struggle with, and I think all centers struggle with, is you and the CHSS and other studies have identified risk factors for us very well that are immutable. Somebody's Z-score is their Z-score. We can't do anything about that. What we can maybe do something about is, is, is ourselves, how well we do what we do and what we do. You've helped us with what we do with decision making, Z scores minus four, do a single ventricle, et cetera. But how do we get at best practices? I've seen people try to do that by dichotomizing centers and looking to see what the best half did. But how about the best practices from the best performances? And you've got that kind of data since you have center specific outcomes. Uh, so so we, we have. Uh, so there are some initiatives uh, to that that are kind of outside of the CHSS. So I know the Pediatric Heart Network has this collaborative learning project where they're going into centers and identifying best practices and then disseminating them out to other centers. Um, that hasn't really been, I mean, you, you said it's an old boys club. It's it's still an old boys club, and <laughs> and you know it's a, a balance. It's always a fine balance between comp competing and collaborating. So so we've uh, you know w since the genesis of the the data center, we've been we do these institution analyses, but uh, we do them blinded. So all our results, uh, I know who the bad institutions are, but no one else outside of the data center would know who the good institutions are and who the bad institutions are. Uh, we have uh, occasionally, when we've analyzed cohorts, we can give an institution their own specific results and, and how they relate to the overall when everybody's pooled together. Uh, and it, it, it tends to be a good report card because the, the report card is actually adjusted for the real risk factors that are weighted appropriately. It's, it's a data-driven uh, report card. You know, one of the uh, things that people are always interested in is uh, the influence of institutional volume on outcomes. And so, uh, uh, which sometimes gives a bad impression of smaller programs that may actually have good results. So what we, we did a study where we uh, looked across different cohorts and uh, solved uh, the institutional outcomes, you, uh, risk adjusted for the analyses that we've done where we identified the risk factors and their weightings. And what we found is that uh, you know, different institutions do well or not so well with different things. That nobody was good at everything. That people had their strengths and their weaknesses, and and that it was unrelated to institutional volume. But uh, you know, another initiative that that's uh, kind of a working through both the pediatric heart network and with uh, CHSS investigators is sort of a technical performance score. So trying to get at uh, the quality of the operation that the surgeon performs and its influence on outcomes. So there's, there is some of the quality work that is starting to come into play within the data center. I want to congratulate you on a beautiful presentation of the ideas that uh, John Kirkland and, and uh, Gene Blackstone have uh, brought front and center to the surgical group. I was a little uh, curious about your statement, though, that uh, 
you, you have not standardized a certain set of baseline data that tends to relate most to prognosis. And I understand you have these cascades from different states to another state. You know, you, you've made that very clear in your talk very appropriately. Um, but can you not link those in ways that do use the instantaneous uh, risk phenomenon and begin to come out with some paradigms where you could then uh, trap a consistent uh, number of descriptive variables. And usually most multivariable equations, as you know, for cardiovascular disease and intervention have less than 10 variables that are really significant at all. And then be real compulsive about defining those perhaps by, you know, the range of overriding of the vessel over the the septal defect or whatever the things are that are significant. Uh, I know Gene and and um, and uh, Kirkland work so much that people kind of would their eyes would glass over when they see all these competing risk curves because you know you're you're dealing with a change in time and a change in intensity of death, and and those are kind of hard variables to put in your brain. They're better in a computer. Uh, what led to your decision, and are you fairly steadfast in thinking in that direction? And let me just put a subscript. I was with Jean Rillo just recently um, on our stitch trial work, who, as you know, is the head of the, of the Canadian Heart Institute and so forth. And he and, and I think the NIH are very interested in, um, in trials which are a little bit more simple and the ones that you can uh, apply kind of in, to a, a cohort that... Uh, can be kind of randomized, but also observational. Have you thought of that methodology, particularly for the congenital cohort? Uh, so that was a whole lot of things. Maybe too much. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> but this is uh, what you've said is so important, but it intersects with a lot of the analysis we're doing on the stitch data in adults right now. And um, so we have some kind of biases internally that it's best to use a lot of the standard Kaplan-Meier stuff that people can understand, easy to relate to the patient. Say, you know, your child has a 10% chance of living through this operation, and then we're going to have another one that will have a 5% and so forth. Right, but, but you know, if you use simple analyses um, for a complex problem, you may not actually be telling the truth. So, you know, and the, the competing risk thing, it actually tells the truth. Um, that's, that's probably... <laughs> no, that's a good statement, hard to argue so with. You, it's just very you can hard to dumb down to things, but you get away from the yeah. truth. And, uh, but and why are you not saying what elements go into truth right now? That's what I'm asking. And it could, usually it's six, eight, ten. That really, and it has to do as with all the things you mentioned in your beautiful lecture, but but we, I mean, you get that initial risk on each of those curves, but you don't necessarily get the survival benefit because the patients change. Right. So I mean, that's one of the beauties of putting in, of of breaking things up into phases is that the you can look at the risk factors as as they change over time. Uh, and that's where the time varying covariates comes in. So you're entering in, and unfortunately, the time varying covariate thing right now is an event. So we can we can modulate patients' risk as they go through interim events and procedures. Uh, you know what we have a harder time doing. We haven't quite figured out the statistical modeling to be able to look at someone's does someone's uh, pattern of of regurgitation influence when the valve has to get replaced. Uh, because that's, that's, those are variables that are longitudinal and changing over time. And, and we just haven't gotten the, cracked the code yet to be able to incorporate them as the, those changes over time as risk factors for these, these end states. Right. I, I understand the complexity. It's a cascade of waterfalls and you don't know the rate and so forth. but. It seems like you'd want to know which variables are the strongest at each of those permutations. Uh, and you can deal with them individually, but then you have to come back to some equation if you're going to make a decision and say it's better to do this procedure than that and so forth. 
Yeah, we're always, uh, we do identify key variables. We, and, and we report the key var variables, and sometimes we actually will give you a nomogram of how the risk will modulate over changes, over the spectrum of key variables. So we, we, we incorporate those into our papers all the time, and, some, and, and those nomograms can be very useful for clinicians with individual patients. And the most thing that's useful is the list of variables how you define them so people can do them the same. Right. And then you can have larger numbers and be more certain with your result. That's right. all I'm so, trying to say. So, so when we uh, did the calculator, the single ventricle versus the biventricular aortic stenosis calculator, in, at the end of that paper in the appendix is the standardized way that, to do the echo. So how we define variables, what variables were collected, that's the easy part, though, getting a whole cohort that you've used the same definitions by different providers to come up with a data set that's large enough to have a lot of certainty yeah, so is the hard part. That's what I'm trying to suggest, yeah, so that's, that's the direction of your future. Right, and, that, and, and that's what happens when uh, some of the variables you're putting in are more qualitative. Right. Where, like, uh, qualitative grade of aortic regurgitation. Uh, is, a, is you, you never know, because uh, even within an institution, you know, one person's mild is another person's moderate. It depends on the settings of the machine. It depends on the different imaging planes. Uh, and that's just within an institution. So there, there certainly would be variability between institutions as well. So, uh, so we have, uh, that's why we kind of, have started having, with some of the newer cohorts, uh, we have an echo core lab. So we've now partnered with a group of, of uh, a multi-institutional group of echocardiographers. We have sort of like a virtual uh, core lab where, where, uh, where people can review and uh, the echoes in a blinded manner um, wherever they are, rather than a site-specific core lab. So, so we are starting to try and increase the, both the, the, the quantity of quantitative information that we have and the quality of that information as well. So I think we're nearing the end. So uh, thank you very much for a great talk. And